Hello, one and all. Hi, uh, I'm Manjinder. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Grade, and I'm here today because I'm an AI enthusiast and I run an education technology company. Thank you for joining us today on the first of many sessions in a series we're calling AI and Higher Education. This roundtable is called, Is it Time to Rethink Teaching and Assessment? But before we get into it, a little bit of housekeeping. The structure of the day today will involve discussions around many topics, around AI, and I think what we're all here for is ChatGPT. On the bottom right of your screen, you're going to see a comment section, a question area, and a poll section. Speaking of polls, we'll be asking you questions throughout the day to get a better understanding of where everybody sits as a group. We understand that polls can't capture everything, so please add extra thoughts into the comment section. These will then be compiled together alongside the discussions and information today into a report which you'll all have access to. We'll also have inf uh, information slides to introduce a topic. So that additional information should be relevant to the conversation that we're having. And then after that, the roundtable discussion will begin around that topic. Following that, we're going to have questions from the audience, from the question section. So note that in the question section, you can actually upvote questions that you would like to have answered. We will then answer the questions that are most popular. So with that in mind, let's do the first poll, shall we? And it is uh, on a scale of one to 10. How do you feel um, about ChatGPT with regards to negativity and positivity? And please, uh, put extra thoughts in the comments. So that's quite interesting. Quite a lot of people are sitting uh, in the middle of that spectrum. I guess there's a lot of uncertainty and I hope that the discussion panel here will help clear up that uncertainty. So with that, um, let's uh, dive in and introduce the panel. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is Ian Dunn. Ian, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, indeed. I'm Ian Dunn, Provost at Coventry University, and uh, I'm here today because I believe AI has the power to um, bring to mass higher education uh, that of an elite education. Thank you. Uh, Alison, how about yourself? Hello, uh, I'm Alison. I'm Professor of Corrosion Science at the University of Birmingham. I'm a former head of department here and a chartered engineer. As an undergraduate in the 1980s, I was taught Fortran on a line printer. I think that ChatGPT now um, is where computers were back then, and I think it's going to rapidly accelerate and become a vital part of life and learning. Thank you very much. Luis, how about yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis. I am a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex, and I am the director of teaching and learning for the School of Engineering and Informatics. I am here to discuss the impact that uh, ChatGPT or AI will have in teaching and learning, and I'm really looking forward to hearing lots of ideas about how this can be used. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, how about yourself? Hi all, I'm uh, Stephen Webb. I'm Head of Technology Enhanced Learning at the University of Portsmouth, speaking in a personal capacity today. Uh, and I'm here because this technology is clearly going to have an impact on how we learn, how we teach, how we work. Um, I also have a user's interest, so I usually have a chat GPT tab open. Uh, I was an early adopter of you.com and I see enough value in at least one platform to, to actually pay for it. So I'm excited by the technology, but I can see lots of problems with it. And I'm interested to hear what other people feel about that today. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Hello, hi, my name is Tom Wall and I work at JISC's National Centre for AI in Tertiary Education. Um, I'm here because um, my, part of my role is making sure that the sector is capable to utilize AI effectively um, and want to 
be part of this conversation to both to listen to other people's ideas and hopefully offer some suggestions um, of my own. Great, thank you. And then uh, Bradley. Hi, I'm Bradley K. Well, I'm a student at the University of Birmingham as well as a software engineer and that app developer. I am very much interested in technology, hence why I'm studying the subject. And I think learning about it on a capacity in theory as well as application is very important, not just for a student as myself, but for everybody. Thank you very much for those introductions, everybody. So let's move on to the first topic, and that is all about ChatGPT, mm -hmm. how it works, its limitations, and students possibly using it to cheat with. But first, let's run a poll to see how much you feel that you know about ChatGPT. So on a scale from one to five, where one is strongly negative and five is strongly positive, how do you feel? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I, I read the wrong thing. Uh, very uncertain and five is very confident. How much do you know about chat GPT and how it works and its limitations? And again, please put your extra comments, uh, thoughts in the comments, please. So we're seeing actually quite a flat um, spectrum between within the middle range there, which I find quite interesting. So not many people are too weak at it, but not too many people are too strong at it, but a lot, quite a broad range in the middle between two, three and four. That's quite interesting. So with that in mind, I'm going to do a little short introduction on chat GPT. Um, so the thing we're going to start with is what is GPT? Well, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Um, and it's a large language model that uses statistics to work out the most probabilistic next word based on billions of parameters when training with a large data set. But a key thing to note here is that it kind of mimic language rather than actually thinking. So think of it like text complete on Gmail or your phone, but supercharged beyond belief. Now, the chat component is the bit that's really accelerated adoption over the last few months. In fact, over 100 million users have signed up in two months, and that's the fastest in history. But GPT-3 has existed for over a year now, and marketers and programmers have been using it for a while to be able to create copy for their social media posts or you know, as an assistant with GitHub Copilot. The chat component is the thing that makes it quite interesting because it's an agent that sits in between you and GPT. It converts the conversation that you're having into prompts that GPT can use to autocomplete the answer. In some sense, it's amazing that this technology even works, but this approach has some significant limitations. It lies, like a lot. Um, and this is due to an alignment problem that we'll talk about later. It can't really do maths or physics or topics that have very subtle, sophisticated connections and arguments. And I think most importantly, the poor input usually causes poor output. And that's because it's designed to produce the next best word or token, I guess, in a more technical sense. And it will generate garbage if you put in garbage. And it's actually been shown in research to generate um, code with bugs and security vulnerabilities if you put in poor code to begin with. Now, something to note, a few things that have changed in the last few weeks is that Microsoft's investment in OpenAI has allowed it to integrate GPT-4 into Bing. Now, Bing, that would make Bing more powerful than ChatGPT, but also Chat, uh, sorry, Bing can cite sources, which ChatGPT cannot. And it's also connected to the internet, which is quite an interesting um, uh, section to be in at the moment. Now, with that introduction over, let's move into a couple more polls and we'll get into the discussion. So the first poll is, are you worried about students using ChatGPT to, uh, or similar tools to cheat? So let's publish that one. And I know the poll isn't over yet, but we've got an overwhelming response of yes at the moment. And the second poll I want to talk about is AI tools in the workplace. So do you think that ChatGPT and other AI tools will be commonplace in the majority of workplaces within the next three to five years? And again, please put 
your extra thoughts within the comments. And again, even more so an overwhelming yes. So I think the uh, the group here today is worried about uh, students using tools like GPT to, to cheat, but is also aware that we are going to be dealing with this in industry. Um, it's going to be commonplace quite soon. So the first question I have today is for Bradley, Allison, and Ian. Uh, what is your opinion about students using tools like these to cheat? And how do you feel about tools like this becoming commonplace in the workplace soon? Bradley, shall we start with you? Yeah, so on a student level, I don't want my uh, fellow uh, colleagues and peers to cheat because that puts me at a disadvantage personally. Um, however, I think it's very important to embrace these tools. The worst thing we can do as an edu edu education around the world is to completely disregard them. A lot, uh, a lot like how I feel Wikipedia gets uh, uh, disregarded a lot, going, oh, it's, it's not very accurate, or da 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 da. Same problems that ChatGPT are having, but will be ironed out over time and is it's very useful you can't deny something like wikipedia isn't useful so wikipedia but you can talk to it you know it's it needs to be embraced um and it's going to be commonplace not just obviously in uh, uh education but in work like as a as a developer myself many times have i already typed things into it to ask it to do computer problems and it spits out code boilerplate yes not accurate not perfect just like how you said about maths but it works which is very interesting i think in my opinion amazing that's that's very true uh alison how about yourself the same question to you yeah i mean my immediate yes i have an immediate problem i'm trying to sort out my next tutorial sheet i put it through chat gpt and uh uh chat and it got pretty good marks so uh you know yes if it's i'm gonna have to adapt what i do so that's my concern about it it's some extra work but i think we have to go back to basics what exactly is cheating? Cheating is a, stu uh, a cheating student is one who gains a mark for knowledge that they don't have. And so we, um, we need to create an environment in which we get students to use uh, ChatGPT to learn, just like a super clever uh, textbook. Uh, if, you give it, if you ask it the same question three times, you get three different, subtly different explanations, which is quite useful. Um, but we need to create an environment in which this is used positively, and then we need to adapt to find fair and accurate, accurate ray, ways of evaluating uh, this, this knowledge. You might ask them to actually review the three answers that they get and, uh, uh, and make a short uh, summary of it, which would be quite challenging for them. Um, or, and we have to have a, a, a combination of that and uh, of course, methods for spotting are helpful as well, spotting, for example, cut and paste answers, and also uh, making sure that we use good old fashioned methods like in-person exams and perhaps a resurgence of fivers. That, that's a really, really interesting take. Uh, I was going to ask Ian to join, but I think unfortunately he's lost his internet connection. So uh, we're actually gonna go straight into the uh, discussion section with the rest of the panel uh, and taking questions from the audience. So please put your questions in the questions area, not the chat, and everybody can upvote the questions that they would like answered. Um, but let's start with the discussion amongst the people we have at the table at the moment. Do we have anything to add to Bradley and Alison's comments there? I've got a comment uh, back to Alison. Uh, so obviously she's talking about uh, re-engineering or as you go say going back to basics when it comes to the idea of cheating and you talk about uh, summarizing different things i i find that as the most vital and important feature of chat gbt because at the end of the day that is what a teacher is a teacher is a way of getting someone's knowledge and summarizing their years of experience um and baking it down for students and the differences with ChatGPT and with AI in general, it will learn, sadly, for humans, very quickly. It is exponential. The amount of data it can get in, the, um, the ways it can phrase things is very interesting. So many times uh, we have a Teams chat in the Computer Science Society 
um, where we can ask questions directly to lectures. And when I do that, I also send the same question to ChatGPT, asking it for bullet points, asking it to summarize in British English, and those kind of ways, to making it say it in a kind of slang way to make it sound a bit more human. And it, you really get that feel that you're learning from somebody. Um, I, I think the next step for ChatGPT will, if it can actually speak to you, that would be nice. And uh, we'll be, uh, we'll have Jarvis then, won't we? But um, I, I think it's very important to not disregard uh, s summation. Um, so asking students maybe to summarize things as a question is sadly might be something that's not possible anymore. Um, but you, you got to think of it in a way of that's helping the students. So maybe, as you say, you have to adapt your tutorial sheets, just like, you know, when Google came around and you could just Google the answer. Same kind of thing, I feel like. Uh, Alison, uh, you had a little comeback to that, I guess. Yeah, if I, if I, if I could be a little bit more precise in, in what I said. Um, essentially, you know, my suggestion was to actually get the students to get three answers to the same question, because they'll all be different. And my experience with ChatGPT in my area, which is corrosion, is that it was broadly right, but a bit rambly, and it missed out on some key concepts. And I think a good learning experience would be to come up with a much shorter, I, I want, I'm going to try it out, uh, is to come up with much shorter synthesized versions of that, uh, which I um, obviously I'll try it out. But it's very much about uh, trying to get the students to learn from what they get from ChatGPT and try and focus it down. Definitely. Uh, Stephen, I think I saw a, a hand there. Yeah, ju just to echo Alison's point there, I, I think this by, by now this is a common experience that um, a lot of academics, when they see the, the response from G GPT, it's bland, it's surface level. Um, and, and, and that in itself can be, I, I think, a useful um, learning experience. You, you can ask students, actually, what's wrong with this response? How, how, how could you make it better? So I think that's a learning experience. To go back to the point um, regarding cheating, yes, students can cheat against other um, students if they get marks they shouldn't have. But equally, I'd like students to realise in this new world that they're cheating themselves because if they simply cut and paste our output from these bots, they're missing out in, on the point of learning, which is to synthesize, to think, to, to think critically and get feedback on that from a human. Um, so they're cheating themselves. Definitely. We've got a question here, uh, upvoted 11 times. Yes, please upvote the questions that you want answered. Um, from Samantha Mullins, at a recent conference, we were informed that Russell Group institutions were looking at returning to more traditional forms of assessment, i.e. exam hall, closed book exams. Do you think that this will happen? It seems like a step backwards. Uh, anybody want to jump into that? Yes. Yes, yes, yes I think it will happen. Uh, and it's, I don't think it is a step backwards because it means that students have to synthesize the knowledge in their heads uh, in a way that is high, is a way that exactly how we want them to learn things uh, so that they can actually tackle themselves by themselves an unseen problem. And so I think, uh, I think it's highly effective. And I think it's not all, you know, it, just because it's been going on a long time doesn't it mean it continues to be good? It doesn't continue to be good. Uh, Bradley, I think I saw a hand up. Yeah, um, I 100% I agree with the, the in-person exams, which is a bit weird from, coming from a student, uh, as some people might think. Uh, me personally, I find the more information I have in front of me, the more I second guess my own opinion. Uh, so w when I if it when I have done uh, exams 
online are right down the answer to a question or something that they were and then I think well is that technically right and then I'll have a look maybe have a look at the different notes that I've written down or whatever and then I'm like oh maybe I should rewrite that question so I'm spending more time second guessing myself than I am doing the work and in a in a workplace environment and just in general in life you can't be second guessing yourself every second asking ChatGPT, asking Google asking you know different things you just got to go with your gut sometimes so I feel in person and that time pressure is important. And that's coming from someone that also has to have extra time in exams and time pressure is a time pressure. Uh, Ian, it's nice to have you back. Um, uh, sorry that, that we dropped you there for a second. I wanted to just get your thoughts on the, the conversation we've been having so far. Thanks, and I'm really sorry about that. I, you asked if we had problems with, you know, with chat and GPT coming along. I can't even manage to stay connected to a live stream after all this time you know um thanks very much you know i um I, i'm really not worried about chat gpt it, yes it's going to create all sorts of problems but as uh, you know the printing press did when, when when we go all the way back there so let's 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 just embrace and get on with it we're not going to row things backwards by by complaining and, and what we have is a, is a real opportunity from my perspective for um to to use AI, not you know, set G chat GPT to one side for now, but a, a real opportunity to um, much more profoundly understand uh, students' learning and, and, and where learning is taking place. Um, you know, the data points that that are generated through the journey through a higher education curriculum. Uh, if we can properly map all of that, all of those data points, and if we can then start to use them as proxies for understanding that learning journey then we can start to really personalize the journey as we, uh, as we go through it. And that brings, as I said in my, my introduction, you know, the idea of an elite education to, 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 to a mass. You know, we can't afford to do it at that, without these technologies. But this is a moment that we can really uh, grasp as far as I'm concerned. The chat GPT stuff, you know, I've just heard the conversation. I have to say, I fundamentally disagree with the examination route. Uh, I, think it's, um, I think it's deeply flawed. People like me, I have a photographic, a short-term photographic memory. I can I can sit in the examination and remember where a, a formula is printed on a, or, or, or in my notes, and wow, that's that's wonderful. But three weeks later, I'm I'm hopeless. So, you know that 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 doesn't enhance my learning, and I'm really interested in learning rather than being able to sit in the examination. Now, I don't say that time pressure and and, and being able to synthesize all of those things are completely important, and I'm I'm, I'm really not dismissing them. Um, I think the the opportunity to bring appropriate, authentic assessment to the to the situation is is really what we what we what we're all talking about, and that's going to be a mix of examination. It's going to be a mix of all sorts of uh, forms of, 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 of testing, um, and AI absolutely is part of that. And as you know, Manjid, we, we talked we talked about this lots about the opportunity that that AI brings to um, to help us grade much more effectively. If someone's written an essay. And let's get into the let's bring it on, on on the other side of the equation too so lots of opportunities and i'm very excited by all of them absolutely tom i think i saw a hand up earlier oh great thank you um i'm really glad ian just used the word authentic um and going back to um both the polls that we, we just looked at one around the use of ai in the work the chat gpt in the uh in the workplace and the point about assessment I think it's it's likely that I mean two key use cases for um, ChatGPT in the workplace. One is likely to be a way of sifting and synthesizing, uh, well, sifting and summarizing uh, information, a new way to inf interface with information, and it's likely that that is going to become a commonplace way to get information. There are going to be a host of skills that need to go with that to make sure that that is that is uh, the right information and appropriate information. And another is likely to be some forms of content generation. We don't want um, to start using these tools to generate content in a way that sort of circumvents any kind of cognitive input from um, the user. But there is likely to be some a lot of use cases where actually content generation based on a stimulus of fully formed ideas from a from a human user, um, and if those are going to be used in uh, in the workplace, it will make sense for there to be forms of assessment to make sure that people have those skills to do that effectively, to um, to 
to stress test and really get a sense of get, getting good quality information using these resources and also generating content based on good uh, stimuluses. So I think that's something that um, is likely to, to evolve and or may involve similar to that um, as, as different forms of assessment. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I've noticed a couple of questions that are very high up regarding the um, uh, the the authenticity or detection of these types of tools and there, that is a section that's literally coming up right next so I'm gonna put those questions to a side for a second. Uh, Kate Richardson has a question here regarding um, that they're concerned that a knee-jerk reaction will return to in person will be to return to in-person exams which is likely to set back the progress that universities have made towards inclusive assessment. So how do the panel think uh, that universities can respond without reintroducing barriers for many students. Uh, Alison? Yes, I, I think if I can, if I can pick that up, um, I'm acutely aware of uh, the problems uh, associated uh, with in-person exams. I think there are mitigations um, in place, and more can be developed. Uh, so, I, I but I wouldn't want to get away from that um, because I think. There is there, you know, having gone through COVID and looking at a huge variety of different methods of assessment, um, they all have their flaws. And in fact, one of the most successful ones that we had with a group of final year students was actually in-person vivas, which because the um, uh, there were small groups and they knew the assessors very well, and so there was good trust between them and it was it, it was a very successful way of doing assessments so i think there's there's a lot there's been a lot of work done during covid and there's lots more that can be due to improve things uh, but we also need to avoid the ones like for example people setting 24 hour online exams which you had a great mixture of stress and and uh, cheating um, going on at the same time so i think it's a complex environment but we shouldn't uh, rule out um, simple things like in-person exams because they do solve an awful lot of problems, although they have to be handled very, very carefully. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's a really good point with regards to inclusive assessment side of things. Have we got another question here from, oh, sorry, Stephen, you had a comment. It, it, it's just a very, very quick one. Um, practically, um, institutions uh, like universities are very, very complex places. They move very slowly. Um, and the technology here is moving very, very quickly. And one of my worries is that the pace of change of this will overwhelm um, the institutional response time. So some knee-jerk reactions actually might well happen, and that would be a shame. Yeah, definitely, Ian. And uh, then we'll we'll have a little short follow-up from Ruth. And, and just again, a very quick comment. I I, I completely agree with uh, with that. I, I just. You know, want to add, there are people around the world doing some really interesting things with very large numbers of students in the online environment. You know, there's lots to learn from that. Um, I talked to Paul LeBlanc at Southern New Hampshire with 180,000 online learners um, and looking at competence-based uh, assessment and, you know, the, the mix, as Alison says, I think is really important. One thing I, I just want to add is, I think we all have to be prepared to be fooled a few times and, and to be uh, and to be tripped up about, about this. You know, I spent um with with a, a, a dear friend who's an ed tech entrepreneur i spent six months talking to his pa in a very friendly way before i realized it wasn't this person wasn't real and uh, and, and I, I i just um you know these things happen and we have to um, accept them and then move on and have systems to cope uh Luis? uh yeah thank you uh one of the things that we kind of forgot about your your question and i think we have gone for a circle and we can come back in the sense that uh how is it going to be used in the workplace uh, and I think this will inform a lot as well the the way we need to use it in in education as well because that is one of the objectives that we have to put people in the workplace. So I think that as uh, these tools become more uh, available in the workplace and they're being used more in the workplace, we are also getting going to get a lot of information from them, and we're going to see what are the best ways to use them uh, both in assessment or teaching and learning uh, with our students. I think that's a very good point. Industry has a tendency to move quite quickly with these tools. I said earlier in this conversation that, you know, people have been using it for marketing and for programming already. And 
I suspect that tools like ChatGPT will become commonplace in the workplace very, very quickly. And using that knowledge to instruct how we should act within education is a very insightful one. So yeah, thank you for that, Lisa. Um, with that, I think we had a really good discussion there regarding ChatGPT, how it works, its limitations, and a significant amount of conversation around the cheating side of things. But now, since that, we've talked a lot about cheating. Let's move on to talking about detecting AI-generated content. So with that, I've actually got a poll for everybody, and that is, do you think that we can detect uh, AI-generated content? Yes, well, yes, poorly, or no. So um, it seems like quite quickly that uh, a significant portion of the audience believes that we can actually detect AI generated content, but poorly. So I think it's probably quite a good idea to explain how um, tools like these exist and how they work um, and how they might work in the future. So with that, let's move on to, oops, sorry. Uh, detecting AI generated content. Now, at the moment, and this is a very early field, detecting AI generated content has two strands. Now we can look at signals within the output of the text, or we can look at watermarking or fingerprinting the model. So on the signals front point, there are tools like GPT-0, GPT-Kit and Grade are all working on tools that detect AI-generated content using this particular method. So for example, AI-generated content at the moment have a few signals that we can detect. GPT-0 use fields like perplexity and burstiness of language. Perplexity is effectively a measure of randomness and burstiness is the variability in sentence length. And AI content at the moment tends to be less random and have kind of the sentence ranges are quite flat. Of course, this can change over time, which means there's a bit of an arms race with regards to the texture versus um, uh, other stuff. You can see in the screenshot there, this is a different tool. It's using six different metrics to identify whether the text has been written by artificial intelligence or not. And as these tools get more sophisticated, like I said, there's an, uh, there's an aspect of an arms race here. It's worth noting though, that this is really a statistical measure and by its nature, it can't be perfect, but at least it's a good start. The second thing is watermarking. It's a very different approach because it's based on the people providing the model. Now, this is based on the this image that you have is based on a preprint paper by Kirkenbauer et al. And it does a really good job at explaining how it works. But the basic idea is to split all possible tokens, which is words basically, into two categories, like red words and green words. And the idea is the splits chosen so that in normal text, when you're writing normally, you'd expect approximately 50-50% words of red and green in the output. But if we bias slightly in the model, green words to occur slightly more likely and red words to occur slightly less likely, then if you start generating any reasonable volume of work, a significant amount of words in those texts will be green. And you can quite quickly identify whether or not, with a high degree of confidence, whether or not that content was generated by AI. So um, with that in mind, I've got another poll regarding what people think assessment will look like uh, in the future. So do we think that assessment will look very different in the next three to five years? And again, please put extra thoughts in your comments. Uh, yes, so overwhelmingly, uh, so far the answer is yes from our cohort. So the second question I have is for Louise, Stephen, and Tom. Now that we've talking about detection, how it's already here or around the corner in some sense, what do you think assessment looks like in the future? And how can we incorporate AI into the assessment workflow itself? Uh, Louise, how about we start with you? 
Uh, one of the things that uh, I want to mention before I kind of answer is that uh, the fact that ChatGPT came at this sort of time, just post-COVID, where, where we have a lot of examinations still online, has uh, make it a little bit of a greater issue uh, because traditionally the exams are designed to be in person. So I think that that's where, where, where it has brought a new challenge. And it has already challenged the way we do assessment. And uh, I think that we are already all thinking on the, what are the main elements of assessment and we're bringing up a little bit more the importance of the learning elements of assessment. And yes, there will be some people that think that going back to traditional exams, they're very robust, not without their, their faults, but they're very robust, they're very good at me measuring some things. Uh, other people will need to rely on tools such as detecting whether AI has been used in the process, and other people will start developing new ways of assessment. And that's the one that I want to go a little bit more into detail, kind of being positive and trying to use it as a tool. Um, I think that this will give the opportunity to uh, generate more authentic and uh, assessments that encourage creativity. So it's not just about finding answers, but how are you approaching the problem? What judgment calls are you making? What decisions can you take? And I think that this is where, where we're going to take uh, at some elements of education into another level. And uh, hopefully it can also emphasize not only what you know, but what can you do with that information and even with a lot of information that is just at the fingertips, even more powerful than just Googling uh, something. So hopefully we can find ways to highlight the strengths, the interest as well of the, of the students. And uh, maybe this will encourage more engagement because it's gonna be in a little bit more of an open world, almost like a video game where, where the students can go and explore different things. And that would hopefully also bring more, a better experience for students, but also for academics in the way we provide feedback, the way we provide support, and how we're exploring uh, complex problems uh, in, of the world. That's a very interesting take. I, I, I love it. Um, Stephen, how, how about yourself? So can I um, play devil's advocate about this technology? Um, Please do. The, the detection of bot generated content. Because so I'm concerned with it, I, I want really peer-reviewed uh, data about the robustness of these things. How many false positives does it give? Do the false positives cluster around particular demographics? Do students feel compelled to change their style of writing, to try and game this? Lots and lots of questions uh, about it. Also, this, this as you alluded to, um, Manjinda, it's, it's a moving target. I mean, I looked at this technology a few years ago and it was really, really poor. And I didn't have the foresight um, to realize we would be here where we are right now, where the technology is really, really impressive. And in 12 months time, it will be better still because we'll have models that generate their own training data, models that can fact check themselves, sparse expert models. It, it'll be a different world again. And I think if we get into a a technological arms race i think we're missing the point you know as you said all these programs are doing is calculating statistical relationships between tokens there's no meaning attached to those tokens or the relationship between those tokens and i think we as humans have to focus on on meaning um because otherwise you know the, the nightmare scenario for me is that we cut out the middleman we have a bot write the question writes an appropriate rubric for marking the question, writes the essay, marks itself, and then sends it off to another bot to see whether that bot can recognize it's a bot. No humans involved and no meaning is generated. No learning um, has taken place. Uh, and another problem I can foresee is that I can imagine a scenario where uh, a, a bot has written the words in a piece of work. But in essence, the real essence of the work has come from a human who's done all the research, come up with all the insights, and is merely using a bot um, for that final surface level um, expression of themselves. That I think would be a creative use, um, but it would get flagged potentially by a detector. Another scenario is that someone uh, takes um, the output from a bot, just tinkers with it to make it look human, gaming the system and that would be a bad use 
because there's no learning, but it wouldn't necessarily get flagged. So I'd, I'd much rather focus on, on humans and on, on meaning than on a technological arms race. Um, does that make sense? No, it makes a lot of sense. I think um, it's one of those things where we might be um, conflating the tools we use for assessment versus the reasons we use those tools to learn. Um, and it's quite an interesting point there, isn't it? Because one could argue if I wanted to make a series of points clear information to my team, for example, I would just use bullet points. You know, and if I take those bullet points and I put them in chat GPT and it writes out a report for me, that's all well and good. But did I really need the report in the first place if the bullet points did a good enough job at conveying that information? And we really need to start be having these conversations regarding what's the what's kind of really the core purpose of the things that we're teaching these like techniques for. Um, also, um, the next person I've got in here is Tom. Do you, uh, do you have any thoughts around this? Yeah, so um, I'd sort of approach this by starting with the distinct distinction between formative and summative assessment. And I'm sure most people in the audience know, but just for those who don't, um, formative or summative assessment is an assessment that is used to, to measure how much a student has learned within a given uh, course uh, scheme curriculum within their whole time at an institution and that can be used for, for credentialing or, or also for, for accountability internally. Um, formative assessment is very much the idea that you are assessing the student to work out what they know and what they, where, where the gaps in their knowledge are so that you can address those and I think because of the stakes involved in summative assessment I think the first place that we're going to see um, a big changes due to AI and assessment will come in informative assessment. And I think there are a lot of things here to, to really look forward to. Um, one of the things I really look forward to in, in AI informative assessment is the opportunity for, for sort of progressive and, and cyclical practice for students. Um, grade is a good example of that. Um, if students are able to get a lot more feedback on their work, um, that means that they can have another go and take on board this feedback and approach particular problems emboldened by the knowledge that they've gained from that feedback. It's possible that we'll see something similar with chat um, GPT as well. And, and one of the things that um, sort of in trying to, in using chat GPT, sort of trying to put forward an argument uh, as your stimulus to it and ask it to come up with some kind of um, uh, retort to that almost this sort of polemical style of, of developing an argument um, and, and as a way to develop your own ideas and to actually make sure that the end product is better. And I, and I can imagine, I can see that as a really good use case moving forward for chat, chat GPT and other such tools is that opportunity to, to have your ideas challenged, but um, which we can do currently uh, in the current model, but at a greater rate and intensity so that you can really develop those um, over time. Um, what I think it's possible will happen in the sort of the dynamic across the education sector is, is if AI can prove its mettle in the formative education space can demonstrate that it is helping to assess students to, to identify where they're at, the strengths of where they're at at a given point, uh, but also giving that opportunity for them to learn based on that feedback and, and progress based on that, that, that there will be, um, I think, more um, a sort of intense look at, at how it can be brought in to, to sort of not so much be introduced to summative assessment, but to, to completely change the models of, of, of summative assessment. So I think that's that's sort of a dynamic I think we may start to see maybe over the next three to five years. Yeah, I think I think that's very that's a very poignant take there, that kind of balance between those two types of assessment that we use within learning is is really quite interesting. I want to really quickly just make sure that we have answered the questions. Uh, regarding the authenticity and stuff. So we've got a question um, here from uh, Bonri, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I think the big question is how do we ensure the authenticity in assessments? This chat GPT came at an opportune time when higher education institutions were grappling with authentication of assessment post-COVID. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I've, I've heard 
from many people already that, you know, when we were assessing within the COVID environment, there were a lot of kind of essay mills that we were worried about and kind of uh, high level, um, like paid for cheating. Uh, and I think ChatGPT is kind of like the supercharged wave of that. Um, and I think I think we as a group have discussed pretty coherently regarding the different ways that we can we can tackle that within within higher education. Um, if anybody wants to add anything, please uh, feel free to add something. Yeah, Bradley. I would like to say Stephen's point earlier was absolutely superb. Uh, um, I, I think it was. But if I could just add to that, the whole thing about the arms race, I 100 percent agree with. Um, I, I don't think that, uh, that there shouldn't really be a focus. So obviously, I don't say that we shouldn't develop these tools to detect. Uh, it's we should, but I, I I really agree with the arm race thing. As someone who is also an advocate of open source technology, which at the moment uh, GPT is open source um, to some extent, um, I see that obviously. As at the moment, it's just ChatGPT. So these tools can tailor themselves to ChatGPT. But as this grows and grows and grows and grows, we'll have open source all over the place, people using different models developed. Even in certain sectors, you could have models developed purely for computer science, models purely for English, chemistry, physics, etc. To get to the point where you can't detect them anymore. And you made a really good point as well about what if maybe if the uh, if the user isn't that articulate, maybe they've done all the work, they've sourced it all. Like we, we don't punish people nowadays for using Grammarly. You know what, what? What's wrong with what's wrong with you know checking your work, making something you know more readable? You you made the point, Majinda, earlier about bullet points as well, and I think that's a very valid point because, as personally, um, I'm I'm very good with. Uh, maybe uh, diagrams and explaining myself when I'm talking to people, but not so much articulate on paper. So uh, maybe in the future, I can talk to a chat bot and it can then write down what I'm saying into a nice uh, word format. So uh, I think it's very important not to do an arms race and to focus on how to change our teaching methods, how to change these different things instead of going, oh, let's, let's try and put this into a box, let's try and stop it. That's not gonna happen. We need to let it free and let us see how it develops in the real world and in industry overall. No, absolutely. I think that's a very poignant uh, point. Um, I think uh, there's a question here from Tree B talking about um, prevention of unscrupulous usage and detection. I think we've covered that. Uh, and there's one other question here from Catalina. Um, says, given that AI bots such as Grammarly, like you just said, Bradley, and Quillbot have been in the market for a while, shouldn't universities have already re revisited their teaching and evaluation methods? Specifically, have UK universities integrated these tools into their curriculum? And if yes, how? I think that's quite an interesting point. I think Stephen um, and Ian were talking about the nature of university moving a little bit slower than the, the industrial side of things. Um, do, does anybody care to comment regarding the speed of uh, adoption with regards to revised teaching and evaluation methods there? It, it, just the same, Majid, it, it is slow. As an institution, we have just implemented uh, Turnitin Draft Coach. So we're, we're slowly changing the mindset from a, a catch the bad guys approach to a developmental um, improvement of uh, writing approach, but that has taken quite some time. Yeah. I think um, there's a balance, right? The, the place where people have the safety to move quickly, should move quickly, and the places where we need to be cautious, we need to be cautious. And sometimes it's just a little bit odd that some places are moving fast and other places are moving so, but really it's all about risk management at the end of the day. Um, okay, I think that's been an, a, a brilliant discussion about um, AI and the assessment workflow. Um, at Grade, we've been thinking about this since, since 2019, and there will be a short demo at the end of the session showing how Grade uses AI in assessment and feedback. But I think we should move on to the teaching and learning aspect of things. So we've got a poll here. Um, uh, 
I realized we don't have a poll here because uh, I haven't put it in. Uh, but the question is, um, um, do you think that we can uh, effectively incorporate AI into the teaching, learning, and assessment workflow? Uh, I'm just going to add that in now, yes or no. Great. Um, a significant amount of yeses. That might this might be our highest yes count so far, actually. Um, so it seems like the, the the bodies here today are quite positive with regards to how we think we can incorporate that in the future. Um, with that in mind, I've got a couple of well, I've got one slide really um, that I'd like to show, and that is I think one that we all kind of come back to as educators, and it's kind of the Bloom's taxonomy, and you know really when considering teaching and learning, it's often quite useful to refer back to this as at least a, as a guide and kind of what parts of the taxonomy are most affected by the incorporation of artificial intelligence. We've said this already, I think Bradley's mentioned this, that you know we could argue that the invention of the internet and Google and Wikipedia has meant that remembering, which is the, the base of the taxonomy, has lost a lot of necessity in working life. Um, and AI challenges many other uh, parts of the taxonomy. So with that in mind, the third question I have for the group, for Alison, Luis, and Ian is, what strategies would you have for incorporating AI into learning and teaching? Uh, let's start with Alison. Yes. Now, I'd uh, very much like to, to, to pick up on this. I think looking at Bloom's taxonomy is really helpful in thinking about where uh, ChatGPT fits in. Uh, you know, as you've already mentioned, Remember has gone with the, the general internet and Wikipedia and so on and so forth. And ChatGPT is a big helper in understanding because it will come up with explanations of things. You can ask it for lots of questions. It also can have the beginnings and will get a lot better at having a go at how to apply things. And that's where we meet the real practical, um, some of the practical training we're trying to do. So um, I teach in, in an engineering discipline. And so we're very mindful of training people so that they can solve engineering problems. And uh, the, uh, I think there will be really, we really need to train them to be able to use chat GPT type um, uh, interfaces really effectively, because that's what they're going to be doing in their professional lives. And the same as it's true in medicine and, and many other uh, disciplines as well. And so we need to make sure that our students have the basic knowledge, the basic knowledge framework and the basic understanding of the processes that are involved. But it's really training them to evaluate the information that they can get uh, from ChatGPT and use it to analyze situations evaluate decision making processes and really come up with the innovative ways of doing things and so we have to make sure that they have the breadth of knowledge to be able to ask the right questions in the first place uh, to be aware of the broad range of challenges that can be in different situations that they meet also knowing about the wider context in terms of the societal economic and environmental and very much ethical framework in which they're going to be offering, uh, operating in a professional world. So I think that we really have to embed um, the future use of this technology in the way in which we develop our students. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are lots of concerns, but also opportunities when it comes to uh, incorporating AI within the workplace, but also within the teaching and learning framework. Um, Luis, did you have uh, anything to add to that? Uh, sure. Kind of in addition, I think that, uh, as you said at the beginning, uh, it, it, it gives a lot of information. It also lies a lot, right? And this is something that we need to understand. We need to understand what can ChatGPT and similar tools can do. And based on that, we can set up uh, how are we going to do it? Do we use it as a black box, just as a tool? that provides some answers. Alison mentioned before, it will provide three different answers. And then we can use those answers to evaluate judgment, to evaluate knowledge, to evaluate decision-making, and so on. 
Uh, but also it can help us to recognize what is the thinking process behind getting this information before uh, thinking how, are, how is ChatGPT generating the, the information that is uh, providing. And I think that's another level of using uh, these AI, AI tools. And it can be quite, um, in some areas and some disciplines, this can be quite interesting just to be in the middle of it as part of the analysis of how we are just making decisions even as humans. And, uh, but whichever kind of approach we use, whether we use it as a black box or, or, to, or to look at the decision-making kind of uh, thinking process of the AI tool, I think that there are various opportunities so, such as kind of using it as a source of knowledge, uh, similar to a kind of more powerful Google uh, tool, uh, but also because of the AI capabilities, it can be a little bit of a challenger. So if you're trying to solve a problem, maybe an AI tool can't be sparring partner, right? So you are trying to solve a problem and it's bringing you the right challenges so that you can test yourself and that you can increase your knowledge, skills and so on. Or um, like um, Bradley say, it can't be a little bit of a guide, a tutor, you know, that is um, taking you through the learning process as well. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities here still to be discovered when we um, fully see the capabilities and as we keep integrating uh, this into kind of our uh, normal environments. But one of the things that I feel very positive about is uh, we can't do kind of tailor problems and specialized problems that are very complex and also that are interdisciplinary because you will not have to be an expert on every subject to get some information, to try to understand people from other areas, to try to gather a little bit where they are coming from, just because you have that information at hand and you can interact with a, with a bot, if you want to call it a bot, uh, to, to get a little bit of information before you go and, and, and start working with other people from different areas. And as I said before, we need to see how is the workplace using it, uh, because that will better inform as well our teaching and learning um, activities. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the democratization of, of knowledge within different kind of areas that one might not have done too much in-depth research in is a great way for us to to kind of increase the scope of the things that we can learn and the things that we can teach and the way that we communicate as a society most definitely um and then ian uh did, did you have something to add as well Sorry, I think you're muted. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll we'll come back to you, Ian, uh, <laughs> when uh, when we work out how, how to to unmute you from from the ether. Um, uh, so let's uh, uh, open the question up to the panel, and um, please, if you're in the audience, please submit questions into the questions tab, and upvote questions that. Um, um, you think are uh, would like answered. So uh, from from the table, does anybody else want to add to the the things that have already been said? Uh, Stephen. So I, I went off in a little bit of a rant, but I, I just wanted to say that I, I think the technology is amazing for the possibility of personalized learning, um, continuous assessments, better feedback. Um, and, I, and I just wonder whether in the future, we're talking about three to five years, whether the interaction that students have with bots can itself become part of um, an assessment um, process. Yeah, I think that'd be quite interesting, you know, having have an exam on how effectively you can interact with the bot because that's something you will be doing in industry. Or well, 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 one of the things that worries me with, with, with Alison building bridges or whatever is people taking this um, output um, with, with, without any sort of criticism at all. Um, safety critical code, um, doctors getting incorrect medical advice. So, so we do need to be critical. And, and, and that's, I think, one of the key skills we need to inculcate in students, a critical approach to this. Uh, Alison, yes, if I, I mean, if I could pick up on that, uh, yes, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, to, to the degree of critical thinking um, uh, associated with the outputs that are that are being obtained, 
And that's why, I mean, we already, you know, in most engineering disciplines, we, we already work very closely uh, with industry, uh, with industrialists. We have some visiting lecturers who come and set industrial problems and so on. And I think that needs to be escalated uh, rather spectacularly. I also think that the point about interdisciplinary interactions uh, are, are also crucial as well, but absolutely critical, developing critical thinking um, is, is absolutely crucial in, in this space. Tom, I, I saw you had your head up as well. Yes, um, I'd just add um, on the point about how AI can, can be introduced into these workflows and, and, and one um, another angle to, to think about is, is how it can support teachers. And I think a big way in which AI will support educators is by taking away aspects of the workload that are, are those which least require, uh, you know, a, a skilled educator to be involved in. And one of those is not so much the interaction with student work and the evaluation of student work, but that's the repetitive, the more repetitive aspects of, of marking. Um, and we've seen automated marking tools that um, for, a, for a long time, you know, those, you know, the pencil, et cetera, you put them in, scan them in, but, um, but we're now seeing AI tools that are able to, to mark uh, longer pieces of work as well as, as multiple choice or single answer thing. And I think that's a really, uh, very brief example, I, I think that's, that's a really um, exciting use of, of, of AI. It's also, I think um, there is a role for, for content generation um through ai um, to support teachers again i don't it, there's got to be that intellectual ownership um from the perspective of the teacher it's got to be their ideas they've got to know the content that they want to teach they've got to know what they're looking for in in, in students yeah, in terms of assessing them either formatively or, or, or summatively but you know if you've you need you want to create 10 questions to allow students to to practice a particular comment uh topic you perhaps come up with the initial seed question and say, right, well, I want, uh, you know, I want another nine questions that require um, and that follow the same logic, that require the same methodology, that have similar uh, potential pitfalls in them so that you can you can um, expand and amplify the, the workload. And you may be able to add to that and say, oh, right, you know, I, I can then go in and curate and, and change them a bit and, and sort of structure and add extra layers of complexity. But um, that's a way I think that AI will, will have a really positive impact um, on teaching and learning is, is just being that that um, a guide that will that, that bit of su a supporting hand for, for educators at, at all levels. Yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the things we haven't really talked about in detail is this concept of knowledge graphs uh, alongside the generative models, right? The idea that you could take a question, give it an example answer, and we could classify the different techniques that have been used um, within answering that type of question to be able to generate similar questions with tackle similar problems. Like people who've used automation tools in the past have tried to do randomized questions you know you put in a variable you know you solve like you know x equals you know uh, two squared or whatever and then you change the two into a three and you're just trying to work out what uh, the variable is and randomization has its problems because you can change the difficulty level quite significantly by accidentally just changing random numbers but if we have embedded knowledge graphs into these uh, solutions we can create like bespoke learning pathways right if you attempt a question you can then get automated feedback through a platform you can identify exactly what areas have gone wrong within the knowledge space and then get a bespoke learning plan based on the weaknesses that you actually have and that's a very powerful thing that you might be able to experience it's a dream that uh, you know i've had for quite a while uh, Alison, i thought i've seen your hand up there as well No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, you didn't? My bad. Didn't. My no. bad. <laughs> I, no, I thought it was, yes. Was it Bradley? Was it Bradley? Maybe it was Bradley. Yes, uh, um, going on, on, you know, how, to, how we can integrate this quite nicely. Uh, last year, for example, I had a lecture explaining how to use um, Google Scholar um, and how to obviously cite and all those uh, things that obviously is very uh, relevant in academia and obviously before that in earlier education I remember very long ago having a lesson on how to use Google um, and this is what um, is really important nowadays 
because yes, ChatGPT has came out and that's all well and good and that's going to develop over time. But obviously me having a more technical knowledge on understanding how GPT works at a slightly lower level, I saw GPT before ChatGPT came out and you had to very delicately create your prompts to get a very nice output. But that, even though ChatGPT is now the case, um, if you um, are very care uh, careful on how you create your prompts, you can generate them very, very, very specifically. You can limit them down. You know, you can you can ask it to word it in certain ways. You can literally tell it to change certain words specifically. Um, and a very good way that I found personally to uh, hone in responses is to ask it to be in a pretend situation and be like, pretend that you are a university lecturer or pretend you are trying to explain to me this or pretend you're talking to a child or whatever. It seems like very silly responses, but you can um, hone it in quite nicely. So I think lectures and lessons um, in higher education and lower education about how to use these tools will empower a lot of people. And I think that is absolutely vital. Uh, Luis, you had a hand up there. Uh, thanks. Uh, one thing that, uh, as, as you were talking, Bradley, that kind of trigger triggered me a little bit when you said about, you know, the, the importance in academia of the of the referencing the sources, right? And kind of why why we do this. And one of the reasons that we do so, when, when you're building knowledge, uh, you kind of need some validation, you know, from from other people that are experts in the subject or that know about the subject that you can to some extent trust and if you want to push the, the the knowledge even further at least that's a, that's a good place to start with and this is where the higher end um, of the Bloom's taxonomy will come very 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 much into place when we do have tools uh, that are like AI assistance where we go hang on what can I do with this information can I trust it and, uh, and how do I make judgments with it because these will be the problems that uh, our professionals of the future will have how do you take a decision with navigating all this information and all these tools, uh, is it the AI who's at fault if something goes wrong, or is it the engineer that's decided to follow the advice or to follow what the AI tool brought? So I think that this is where it gets very interesting in how do we successfully implement it to keep on developing, the, especially the higher ends of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, Alison? Yes, uh, that, that uh, resonates very much with me. I mean, one of the, because uh, you know, I'm preparing my tutorial sheet at the moment, I, you know, one of the questions that I, I tried out, um, I got a slightly long and rambling answer, but one of the things I spotted in it um, was a concept in my field that has rather fallen out of favour. Um, and, uh, it, it, of course, um, ChatGPT just picks up what's out there uh, but it doesn't, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, some of the things that have been around for a very long time have, have stood the test, test of time and some of them haven't. Uh, but it's all delivered uh, with um, equal confidence. And so I think that's certainly another aspect to be considered out. And as um, more and more publications and um, information goes out into the real world, um, knowing the you know, validation of sources then becomes absolutely crucial in terms of what information you incorporate in your perhaps safety critical decision making process. Uh, ab absolutely. I think we've got um, a couple of, oh, Ian, I want to double check. Can, can we hear you? <laughs> I hope so. Yes, wonderful. Uh, did you have anything to add? Well, if I may, just, just very quickly, sort of taking you to, you know, as, as you'd imagine from my university administrative sort of perspective, um, Taking it sort of to to the level of uh, the role of AI in in supporting the teaching and learning, the development of teaching and learning, and the, the whole of the the ecosystem. You know, I, I very much um, you know think that the opportunities that we have to understand whether a student has grasped the concept or not, how confident they are in grasping the com uh, that concept. And the proxies, the data that can provide to us about, you know, I can I can I can insert a multiple choice question there, question uh, right at the beginning of a of a module to 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 test certain concepts or or, or confidence, um, and and then use those data points as uh, over time, along with lots of other things. So long as we see the university administrative support systems 
and the EdTech ecosystem that sits around it as, as, as all part of the same thing, then we can develop a very interesting picture of the, um, uh, of the student's learning journey. And then we can go out to some amazing sources that, are, that exist out there to scaffold or stretch a student, a student who's flown through a subject. I want them to continue on that learning journey. I don't want them to stop just because I've run out of things to say in my semester. Um, uh, equally, the student who misunderstood something in week one doesn't quite have the confidence to speak up in lecture or tutorial. Um, being able to find out that they've misunderstood something um, through those data points, I think, is a really important way of ensuring that, that more people are able to engage more, more, more profoundly. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested really in how we embed the techniques of AI, of, of machine learning and of, of, of managing enormous volumes of data about learning in order to support learning. And then we need to plug in the appropriate tools with the safeguards and all the things that we've been talking about in order to create, I think, a very, uh, a much more modern view of um, uh, the system. So I'm, I'm interested in AI at that, at that sort of administrative level, if you like. No, definitely. There's, there's kind of, um, there's, there's an interesting point there that you just made, you know, in the sense that if we're, we're teaching students these concepts that we've been teaching for tens, if not hundreds of years, you know, and, and we're building upon the things that have already been taught, and if we have that information and that knowledge in a in a place that is democratized and available to everybody, we can use that information to improve the learning uh, of, of students worldwide, right? And there's really quite an incredible thing that we can do there. Um, I, I just want to point out that I've only been teaching for tens of years, not hundreds, okay? So <laughs> it may appear the other. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple of questions here. I think um, Zach's made some interesting points, um, a couple of questions. So, you know, as a teacher, I've experimented with using ChatGPT to write a lesson plan, slide outlines, make a rubric, so it can save me time with my work. Am I then cheating as a professional, or should I inform my students and colleagues of this? And, and also, you know, Zach's got another question here, which says, you know, what does it mean to teach, uh, to learn, and to assess student competencies in the age of AI. Um, and and I think we've covered that last one quite a bit. And I think Zach's first question is quite interesting there too. I think for me personally, you know, the concept uh, is really about what the purpose of the thing you were trying to do was, right? Um, in industry, we don't worry when you use a calculator or a program to speed up your calculations because it's likely to be more accurate in scale, etc. Right, but the outcome was always the thing you designed the program to do. It wasn't the process that you were doing it for it. And this is really that philosophical debate that we've been having kind of underlying the conversation that we've had today, which is, you know, assessment as a form of learning and what that looks like and cheating in the sense of, we really want to identify whether students have actually learned something and the traditional forms of assessment might be, be challenging uh, that when we look at tools that can answer those questions. I mean, those in the STEM fields have already heard of tools like Wolfram Alpha, for example, and that can solve incredibly complex mathematical equations and you know differential equations, all this sort of stuff for you. Um, and no one's really worried. That tool's existed for 20 plus years now. And uh, we, you know, we, don't, we don't bat an eyelid because the, the point of the assessment is to t teach the techniques that's required for you to use those techniques in the wild not necessarily to do those problems. Um, so I, I suspect that there's a short-term scare that's clearly occurring here. Everyone's There's a significant number of the people that are in the call um, worried about cheating and all that sort of stuff. But we all kind of see this, this potential, you know, rosy future where AI is incorporated in everything that we do, just making our lives easier. But we all understand the importance of doing so ethically, doing so with guidance, making sure that bias and so forth is... Um, uh, in, like avoided at all costs. Uh, did anybody else have any comments with that before we move on to the next section? Uh, Luis? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. The first one is that uh, I think that as, as teachers and, and tutors, you know, we, we, we kind of have a plan of what we want the students to go through, uh, how, do, how do they get their learning and everything. And uh, we use a lot of resources, right, including from textbooks uh, to, to the internet. Uh, and I think that ChatGPT can help you to some extent, and if it aligns with your strategy, it's perfectly fine. And my second point is like also from the point of view of the students, 
Uh, I don't think that the, we are expecting them not to, to kind of search for other resources, right? But to get the resources in their brains, process them, and come up with their own views, with their own ideas about the, uh, about what they are seeing. And that includes even data and information. So it's how we use the tools really, uh, what what matters, and how does that align with the way we're doing kind of the bigger picture. And uh, but this, I don't think it's a find um, a very strict line where you go, I hit on that, you cheat it, it's, it's a lot of the context as well. Absolutely. Um, so with that, let's move on to the next section. And that is additional issues with AI. We've been skirting around this with access and open uh, source technologies and all that sort of stuff. So I want to ask the um, everybody who's here, uh, a poll, which is on the scale from one to five, where one is not worried and five is very, very worried. How worried are you about the issues with these systems, i.e. embedded bias, the alignment problem, financial access? And again, please put your extra thoughts in the comments. So immediately we're seeing quite a few um, fours there. Um, so not incredibly worried, but definitely worried. Uh, so with that, I'd, I've got a slide here to just go over a couple of these points. So when talking about um, kind of extra issues, let's first start with the alignment problem. So the way that ChatGPT has been trained is by training an agent to produce good prompts because you know, asking humans to create these prompts is quite difficult. They flipped it on its head and they said, okay, let's ask humans to review if the output was good or bad. You know, if you've ever used OpenAI, if you notice the thumbs up and the thumbs down on the side, that's a still a hangover of that technology and that kind of tagging of those types of responses. Now, the problem is not all people know what good output looks like. Like I'm not a poet, for example, and not everybody understands deep, complex topics. So therefore, if ChatGPT had the option to misinform, be it convincingly, you know, or say that it didn't know, well, the didn't know answer is categorically always going to get a thumbs down. But the slightly misinformed topic would, could get a thumbs up. And if it's relatively convincingly done so, then it's quite likely to do so. It's in some sense, it's incentivized to do it. There's a problem with the alignment of how things are being trained. Now, this is also true for creating kind of middle of the road content. I know that Stephen and um, Alison talked about this. The content that's generated is often quite surface level and not like great. And that's because when something looks good on the surface level, you know, it's often going to be valued more than something that is actually good and detailed because complex poetry, for example, uh, or songwriting is, is quite nuanced and might not look that good uh, on the surface to the average person who's reviewing these things. And if the, the model is therefore incentivized to create kind of mid-tier content. Um, <coughs> sorry. So next, if we talk a bit about embedded bias. Now, GPT and other large language models are based on lots of data from the internet. So there's a lot of bias that may and probably is embedded into that tool. So that means that it's going to impact the output. And when it's used in, say, a research setting or an industry setting, it's going to affect the quality of the work that's produced. And there is a good chance that it could be quite effective at spreading bias more effectively than we ever have before. And lastly, financial access. You know, I know these tools are, at least for now, open source, but the implementation of them is not necessarily. At the moment, ChatGPT Plus is $20 a month, and it offers like the fast, being able to be available when demand is high, faster responses, access to priority features. And it's going to be quite likely that paid models will be better than their free counterparts. And that's almost definitely going to result in students with higher financial means allowing to get further ahead and thereby broadening the financial inequality gap. So in some sense, you know, there's a future where a lot of knowledge is democratized and we all have access to it and we have all access to kind of learn much faster with this tech. But there's also a future out there where those with means might have access to better technology, thereby increasing that gap. There are quite a few issues there that um, we can talk about. Um, in terms of the question, though, the next question is for Tom 
and Stephen. So how do you, would you use these kind of AI tools effectively? Do you think that AI will, you know, unfairly advantage students who can afford it? So let's start with uh, Tom. Uh, I think you're muted. <laughs> was I, I think I was the first person or, or only person to get that. So um, I sort of win or lose there. Um, I, first, on the point about accessibility, I, I think I would say I'm cautiously optimistic that at least in, in sort of developed countries at, at the UK, it, there may not be that, that divide um, in terms of access uh, based on socioeconomic uh, lines. Um, Two, two reasons I think that primarily. One is that as we're seeing with um, Bing, it may well be that these kind of technologies become um, ubiquitous. They become, uh, as, as, uh, as search engineers, it becomes a, basically a new way to search and to interface with, with the information um, on the web. And business models will sit behind that. Uh, potentially new business models will be developed um, that don't require that premium. The other reason, which sort of is, is a, as a sort of belt and braces, I think if it does become a case that um, you have to pay for, for better versions of these software, in education at least, I think it's likely that just with um, most packages that are used, um, you know, and, uh, Moodle and the like that are, that are very commonplace in education, it will be the, the institution that is paying that and and that um, rather than the user directly. So I'm I'm I have some um, hope that it won't cause those those divides that you um, mentioned. In terms of how to use AI effectively, the one one thing I would just say is is the golden rule should be build on uh, solid ped pedagogical foundations. Um, it, one of the, the current sort of areas of AI. Um, that's that's perhaps more established is that of personalized learning. Personalized learning really starts from the principle of, of differentiation, the idea that different learners um, will learn at different paces, will have different uh, starting points in terms of their knowledge, uh, and may have different sort of preferences in terms of how they learn, not, not your sort of, you know, sort of VAK, you can fit, neatly fit people into boxes, a bit like that, but um, there will be sort of differences in, in the ways people learn, the types of material people like, the types of pacing people enjoy. And I think um, that's something we, we, we understand pedagogically. AI platforms that do personalised learning effectively are building upon those foundations. Similarly, we've talked a lot about formative assessment. That is a very strong um, there's a, a, a pedagogical approach with a very strong grounding in, in both literature and practice. Um, and we're seeing a lot of the AI that is that is being developed and is, is very effective and promising um, builds upon um, the approach, the idea that assessment uh, can be a really strong tool to, um, to promote and enable learning rather than just a way to say that learning has already happened. So yes, the golden rule for using AI effectively is, is, is build upon strong pedagogical foundations. Uh, absolutely. I think that's true when it comes to kind of incorporating any new technology, actually. Um, Stephen, how about yourself? Um, so to, to, to follow on from what uh, Tom has said, I, I think at this stage, at this point in time, none of us actually know what is the most effective uh, use of this technology in education because the research evidence isn't there yet. Um, it's been really enjoyable over the past two, three months watching the creativity on display when people, when academics play with this technology and they say, oh, I can use it to do this, I can use it to do that and it saved me a bunch of time doing that boring stuff. And, and, and myself, I, I've, I've come up with use cases that I didn't expect to come up with. But whether it's really useful, really effective, really valuable, I don't think we know that yet. Um, and, I, and I think there's scope for a lot of um, research in this area, and I hope it takes place um, fairly quickly. And I think staff and students need to work together to find out what's useful and effective and, and, and valuable. And I think the difficulty for someone that sits in, in, in my space is ensuring that staff and students have the skills that they need to work with this technology. Um, academics in particular, time poor, um, so that 
it's, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for, for, for certain members of staff supporting other members of staff. In, in terms of equity and affordability, I was more on the um, worried side of things because I think there are huge issues around equity and affordability, potential issues, that they're not insurmountable. Um, embedded bias is an issue. I mean, Jinder, you said yourself, it's trained on the internet. I mean, how is that not going to be a problem? So we're going to get conspiracy theories and incorrect advice and pure falsehoods. And, and hallucinations as well. I mean, sometimes these bots just go off to do weird things. So, so, so those are uh, uh, particular problems. But around equity and affordability, the tech is currently free, but it's burning through energy. Um, it's a huge amount of compute power. So I think somehow companies are going to start recouping um, those costs, and, and, and there's the potential. Um, that that might lead to um, cases of digital poverty. Um, but I, I think, as I said, the, the problems are not insurmountable. And, and just this morning, um, I, I read a report that Tony Blair and, and William Haig are pushing for sovereign AI systems backed by supercomputing capabilities. And it, national bodies like JISC and Kaiser and, and, and so on, I think if, if they can get behind this, at an early stage, and it's good that we're thinking about these things now. Um, th these are not insurmountable problems, but if we don't address them early, I think they could be problems. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a, there's a question here from uh, Abby uh, saying, how should universities allay staff fears and support staff to embrace chat GPT, and I guess other AI tools? I guess there's a question here regarding um, kind of knowledge, right? Uh, Quite often, we're afraid of things we don't fully understand, and maybe there's a there's resources that can be put out, made for all educators, not within just higher education, but also secondary and primary education, for, about how these tools work, about the limitations, about ideas that they could use to incorporate it within their learning systems, um, just to kind of allay those fears. Really, what, what do people think about that? Uh, at least. Uh, yeah, I think that one of the main ways that universities can support first is le letting the uh, the lecturers take the preferred assessment method, right? So not push any kind of forced innovation, if it were, because there could be some potential. So we, we kind of discuss, and I touched it uh, before in my answer, I think that some people will be keen and inclined to go back to the paper examinations or invigilated examinations. Some people will like to, okay, I don't want to think too much about it and let the detector do the job and, and tell me whether the answer is uh, it's being using uh, generated using AI tools and there will be some people that will be keen on, on building on and I think that uh, we need to keep like uh, Stephen has raised very very good points and these points need to be at the center of uh, of when we are using the tool we have to keep this all the time in our minds whenever we are uh, developing any kind of uh, assessment or, or teaching technique using AI tools. Absolutely. Um, uh, Ian. J just a, a quick comment on the affordability and the, you know, uh, I want to just echo what Tom said. Universities will, once we have demonstrable value from, from tools, we will incorporate those and remove others. It, it, it's, as, it's as simple as that, you know. Um, uh, how many universities provide the, the textbooks that we insist that students must acquire, uh, you know, the, the, the enormously expensive. So the, the, there are there are things that will move out and other things that will move out. But um, um, uh, you know, we, we do have to keep it in in account. Just to also a comment on Luis's point, I, and just to slightly disagree on on the assessment. I think so long as the assessment is built in a coherent way across a a program of study, I, I think I think I agree with you, Luis. Uh, allow it to be uh, as flexible. But um, if it's not coherent, then it, it just becomes um, a whole batch of misplaced learning um, for, for students and learning how to deal with the assessment model rather than actually dealing with the subject knowledge, which I think is a, is, is a very poor assessment. So I know you're not saying that. Uh, Bradley. I think there's a point uh, I've, I think a lot of people have missed in general, especially with Bing coming out. Um, uh, we're talking about this equality thing and all this is that obviously Bing is starting to use sources, 
Now, if if I type a question into Bing or whatever, and I get the response, and it sort of says, what gives me an incentive to actually go and click through onto those websites? Those websites have taken time and money to generate these sources. And as academics, that's your job to generate sources and make money. Now, when it comes to how they're going to provide it, obviously ChatGPT are going down the route of a paid subscription, but especially with Google Bard, which is a competitor coming out, hopefully in the next few months, um, the question will come, what if advertisers get in the way of information? Advertisers are, can pay to get high up the search like they do now. You have the little ad. Not a, people, not a lot of people recognize that, but you can have ChatGPT go, hmm, I'm, you're asking it a question and it's biased towards Pepsi or Coca Cola, or it's not going to talk about iOS as much as it should because it's a Google service. You know, so how do we prevent large companies uh, from protecting their interests? but not protecting the interests of freedom of information uh, on consumers. Uh, Alison. Yes. Now, I think that the point that uh, Bradley has just made is an extremely important one. And I think this is where we also need to work very closely with uh, professional bodies and industry and really think about training our students to have the right kind of critical thinking to handle these things because these problems will face professional engineers will face doctors and and, and so on uh you know for example thinking of think about the opioid pri uh, crisis and uh you know various uh, opioid manufacturers it was strongly encouraging people to use these uh, these drugs that have turned out to be so disastrous so i mean i think that's a very good ex you know it, i think the point that bradley's made is very very important and so that's why in the educational space, we need to work ever more closely uh, with the in industry and professional bodies to make sure that the, what we're educating our students to do is going to make them uh, really strong and effective professionals once they get out into the world of work. Absolutely. I think uh, we've had an absolutely wonderful discussion here and I. I want to thank you all for participating and I want to thank the, the audience for, for um, asking those questions. So thank you again, everybody uh, around the table.